so uh, we will continue with the spectroscopy uh, chapter and uh, uh, the last uh, section in proton uh, uh, NMR uh, uh, spectroscopy we want to talk about the hydroxyl hydrogen as uh, you recall we said that this hydrogen can appear at a very large in a, within a very large window in fact between 0 0.5 and 5 part per million this hydrogen can be involved in hydrogen bonding, and it depends on the concentration, on temperature, on the solvent, on the structure, where would this hydroxylic hydrogen appear. Um, sometimes you, uh, you can observe splitting in the OH uh, proton, but most of the time you don't. And in fact, uh, most of the time you will uh, observe the hydroxylic hydrogen as a broad peak but you rarely observe splitting in the OH. However, if you suspect a signal to be that of a hydroxylic hydrogen, you can do a very simple experiment and prove that that hydrogen is that of a, an OH. And the way to do it is to add D2O. You add to your sample D2O. If that hydroxylic Signal. If that signal is that of a uh, hydroxylic hydrogen, it's going to disappear. The reason for this is that when you add D2O, there will be a hydrogen deuterium exchange between your compound and D2O. So you don't have NOH anymore, you have OD. So if you are uh, having an NMR spectrum, before you add D2O and you have a signal, after you add D2O, that signal is that of OH, it's going to disappear. So you can do a very simple experiment and you prove that hydrogen to be uh, of hydroxylic, uh, a hydroxylic hydrogen. Now, uh, we're going to do a little exercise here. We have this reaction. We have uh, methylene cyclohexane. And the reaction is believed to lead to either of these two products. This is the NMR spectrum of the product. So the first part of the question, based on the NMR, what do you think is the correct product? Is it cyclohexyl methanol or one uh, methyl cyclohexanol? Anybody? Yes. Cyclohexyl methanol, why? Uh, do we have the broad singlet of the OH? Where? The, the colored one. The pink one. Well, actually, the colored one is giving you a hint. You need to look at the colored one to rationalize whether your answer is the first one or the second one. But what, um, how is that uh, leading you to the answer? Why is it not of this OH? If you, if you think that uh, the colored peak here is that of OH, it can be for this one or that one. <laughs> Triplet. OK, so? <laughs> Which hydrogens are these hydrogens? Okay, so are you looking at splitting or are you looking at chemical shift or are you looking at both? You need to look at both, right? If you are having hydrogens that are close to an oxygen, where would, where would they appear in the NMR spectrum? Yeah, what is the chemical shift? Around? Above 3, 3.2, 3.3 part per mil, right? Can you have any signals at 3.3 parts per million in this compound? No. Why not? No you do not have any hydrogens right here. Correct? You do not have any hydrogens over here to appear in this region. While here you have these two hydrogens and they will appear at 3.3 parts per million in terms of... Uh, chemical shift. Now comes you to 11 question. What are the conditions? 
What are the conditions that will get us the first compound? It is a hydroboration oxidation. I accidentally clicked it. As you recall, hydroboration oxidation will get you an alcohol. The addition is anti-Markovnikov. What are the features of the, what are the other features of hydroboration oxidation? What are the features? Is it uh, an anti-addition, sin addition? It is a sin addition. It is a sin addition. You will get the OH and the hydrogen to add sin. OH will add to the less substituted uh, carbon. Do you get any rearrangement in hydroboration oxidation? The answer is no. You do not have any carbocations. Right? We learned how to form alcohols from organic one by adding H plus H2O. That involves the formation of a carbocation, and the addition is going to be according to Markovnikov's rule. Because you are getting a carbocation as an intermediate, it has to go to the more stable carbocation, which is the more substituted carbocation. So the addition, uh, uh, the, the reaction is hydroboration oxidation. And uh, now uh, we are going to talk about conformations. What about uh, conformations? Does anamor, is anamor able to detect an axial hydrogen versus uh, an equatorial hydrogen? And the answer is no. Because most of the conformational changes going uh, from one conformation to another conformation, they occur so fast that the NMR cannot detect them. The, basically, what you observe when you determine an NMR spectrum of a cyclohexane, you are observing the average of both conformations. Now, one, one way to do that is to slow down the conformation. And you can slow down the conformation by lowering temperature. What you want to what you, uh, what you are trying to achieve is to freeze the conformation so that you are having a hydrogen that is axial and a hydrogen that is equatorial. If you look at the NMR spectrum of cyclohexane at room temperature at 25 degrees Celsius, you are going to observe only one peak, and that is the weight average of the axial and the equatorial. However, if you slow down the conformation exchange or the equilibrium, the ring ring flipping, if you, uh, if you slow down this ring ring flipping, and you can do that by lowering temperature at minus 90 degrees, then you will be able to get uh, a signal for the uh, axial and another signal for the equatorial. With that in mind, I would like to ask you the following question. What is the name of this compound first? Dimethylformamide. This is DMF, and dimethylformamide. How many peaks do you anticipate to see in the proton NMR spectrum of DMF? Two, right? One for the methyl groups and one for hydrogen. And that will be the wrong answer you will actually see three peaks in DMF. These two methyl groups are different. But can anybody tell me why? So you actually have three signals in the NMR spectrum of DMF. Yes? How is the lone pair of nitrogen helping in having two peaks? There's no axial and equatorial here, right? You're partially correct. Anybody else? They are diastereotopic. They are diastereotopic. That's correct. The two methyl groups are diastereotopic. Why? Why? Yes. Right? No. Because this lone pair is in conjugation with the double bond, and the resonance structure 
C double bond N CH3 CH3 plus O minus hydrogen. There is effective electron delocalization between the nitrogen and the carbonyl. So that you do not have a single bond between the nitrogen and the carbon of the carbonyl. In fact, you have a double bond. And that will make the two methyl groups to be diastereotopic methyl groups, and therefore they have different chemical shifts. Follow up question. Design an experiment so that these two methyl groups they coalesce. The uh, scientific term for these two uh, peaks to uh, appear at the same chemical shift is coalesce. What is the experiment that you can do that can get the two peaks to coalesce. Anybody? What did we do with cyclohexane? Why did we lower the temperature in cyclohexane? We were slowing down. Right? Now what do we do? We increase the temperature. If you increase the temperature, you will not have the double bond character. It's as if you are breaking the double bond character. In fact, if you do an experiment and you are having these two peaks, you determine the proton NMR spectrum at room temperature. You have two peaks. Increase the temperature. You will see that the two peaks, they start uh, coming closer to each other till you reach what's called the coalescence temperature at which you, at which you are going to have the two peaks to overlap. OK. So now we are uh, going to start talking about uh, carbon NMR. Well, both proton NMR and carbon NMR, they give us information about non-equivalent nuclei. Both the proton NMR and carbon-13 NMR, they give us uh, uh, information about the environment of the nuclei, whether a proton nuclei or carbon nuclei. They tell us about the hybridization state, what kind of attached atoms we have. Um, it is uh, a convenient method to use FT NMR, Fourier transfer NMR for proton NMR. In carbon-13, you have to use Fourier transfer NMR. This has to do with the fact that the signal for a carbon-13 is very small. And when uh, we determine NMR, you can do it in five minutes and you will get a proton NMR spectrum. But for carbon-13, you have to do it for like an hour and sometimes a couple of hours and maybe 24 hours. The concentration, you can have a dilute sample and uh, determine the proton NMR. For carbon-13, you have to use a much more concentrated sample. You need Fourier transfer, transform uh, uh, NMR because the peak is 10 power minus four times weaker than the signal of a hydrogen atom. When you are uh, doing Fourier transform, then what you will get is uh, the, the information or the data is going to accumulate. And when you are observing this peak after a couple of uh, minutes or half an hour, one hour, you will see that the peak uh, is going to start uh, increasing. Now why? Why do we get the signal of carbon-13 to be much weaker than that of proton? This has to do with two factors. First, the kind of uh, nuclei that we are using. So the magnetic properties of the carbon is different from that of the proton. And another very important uh, factor is the natural abundance of uh, a carbon nuclei. The C13 exists at 1.1%, while for a proton NMR, it's more than 99.99%. Now, one advantage of a carbon nuclei, if you recall, we said that the spectral, uh, the, the spectrum window in a proton NMR, it goes from 0 to 10 or 11 part per million. In a carbon nuclei, in carbon NMR, you are having the spectral window to go from 0 to 220 part per million. And I'm going to show you an example in the next slide. In the next slide, we are going to see a proton NMR of one chloropentane, and then we are going to look at its carbon-13 NMR. For instance, in the absence of integration, in the absence of uh, the structure of the compound, and I look at this proton-NMR spectrum, that could be deceiving. 
It can deceive us in the sense that I see four different signals that can deceive us or it can uh, uh, mislead us into believing you have only four different types of uh, hydrogen. This has to do with the fact that you are getting some signals to overlap. Now, you can, now uh, if we say that this is an amount of one chloropentane, we can find out that these hydrogens must be the ones that are close to chlorine and the uh, most upfield hydrogen must be those of the methyl group. But what about these two? Are they for these two CH2 groups, this one, or for this, these two CH2 groups? So is this, the, the signal for this methylene group, is it overlapping with this methylene group or is it overlapping with this methylene group? Well, first let's look at the carbon 13 NMR spectrum of one chloropentane. We have now five signals. We have one, two, three, four, five signals. Because I have four different carbon nuclei. Uh, five different uh, carbon nuclei. One, two, three, four, five. Now this peak here, you will always observe it. When you are doing an NMR in CDCL3, you will see a triplet at 77 uh, part per million, and that is uh, for the carbon bonded to deuterium. Now it, it is a triplet because the spin of a deuterium is 1, 2n plus 1, it will be 3. So you are having here five uh, uh, separate distinct peaks and these are corresponding to five different carbon nuclei. Now remember when we talked about uh, proton NMR, we said if you are having an electronegative uh, atom, that electronegative atom, or if you are having an electron withdrawing group, is going to affect the uh, chemical shifts for the protons. The effects on the carbon-13 chemical shifts are even uh, higher. And uh, also the hybridization state of carbon affects the chemical shift. Let's take a look. For instance, if you are going from methane to primary to secondary to tertiary, the chemical shift with the, the proton uh, chemical shift 0 0.2 to 0 0.9 to 1.3 to 1.7. If you go to the carbon-13, for methane it's minus 2, for ethane it is 8, you go to propane, we are talking about this carbon, so now this carbon is attached to two carbons, you have it at 16, this carbon is attached now to three carbons, it's at 25, this quaternary carbon is attached to four carbons, it is at 28. Because now you are changing a hydrogen for a carbon, and carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen, and the effect is uh, cumulative. Another example, if you look at the proton NMR, the signal for the proton in methane at 0 0.2, in methylamine at 2.5, in methanol at 3.4, fluoromethane at 4.3. You look at the carbon-13, minus 2 to 27, to 50 to 75. So the effect, the electronegativity effect is higher on the chemical shift of carbon-13 signals. If you look at the signals for the carbons in uh, one chloropentane, as you go further from the electronegative atom, the chemical shift is going to be smaller, or you can say that the carbon is more shielded. So you go from 45 to 33 to 29 to 22 to 14. So that the shielding effect of chlorine decreases as you go further from the electronegative Now what about uh, sp3 hybridized carbons and sp2 hybridized uh, carbons? Well, sp hybridized carbon is more shielded than sp2, and sp3 is more shielded than uh, sp. This will lead to having uh, the sp3 at uh, a lower chemical shift, sp2 138, 114 for an alkene, for a benzene 126 to 142, and as you can see for sp hybridized carbon, you are getting the sp hybridized carbon to be less shielded than the sp3, but more shielded than the sp2. Can anybody tell me why do you think this carbon is less shielded than this carbon? That's right. This carbon is attached to, 
of course, sp hybridized carbon, but it is attached to hydrogen, while this sp hybridized carbon is attached to a carbon. Carbon is more electronegative, that is going to result in having this carbon to be more uh, downfield. The carbonyl peak in an ester or an, analde an aldehyde or a ketone can be easily detected in a carbon 13 uh, spectrum. This has to do with the fact that very few peaks they appear in this region, the 170 to 200, 220. And the number can tell you whether you are having an aldehyde or a ketone or an ester. And the peak will be small in size, but you can see it very clearly. We're going to talk uh, about uh, the height of uh, uh, C13 uh, peaks. In an ester, it appears, it appears at 171 parts per million. So in the following couple of slides, I'm going to just go over some numbers for uh, uh, chemical shifts or, uh, of uh, carbon. If you are having monosubstituted, it appears between 0 and 35, disubstituted 15 to 40, trisubstituted 25 to 50, tetrasubstituted 30 to 40. If you are having an sp hybridized carbon, it appears at 65 to 90, SP2 hybridized carbon and an alkene, it appears at 100 to 150 of a benzene at 110 to 170 part per million. Um, of course, in any exam, you will be provided with tables with all of these numbers. If you are having halogens, bromine versus chlorine, you will uh, have uh, the chemical shift 20 to 40 versus 25 to 50. And an amine, 35 to 50, an alcohol, 50 to 65, an ether, 50 to 65, C triple bond N, the carbon of a C triple bond N at 110 to 125 part per million, the carbon in an ester at 160 to 185, while that of a ketone at 190 to 220. So you can distinguish a carbonyl whether it is of an ester or an aldehyde or a ketone by looking at the chemical shift in the carbon-13 NMR. Now, peak intensities. First, regarding carbon-13 NMR, the peak intensities can also be deceptive. So it's not if you are having a uh, longer peak that you have more carbons. Every peak corresponds to a set of equivalent carbons. It can be one, it can be 10. You never integrate, you never integrate uh, the peaks in a carbon-13 uh, uh, NMR. So the pulse FT NMR distorts intensities of signals, the peak heights and the areas, they can be deceptive. For instance, if we are uh, looking uh, at uh, the carbon-13 NMR uh, spectrum of uh, metacrizole. How many different uh, carbon-13 peaks do I have? I have seven. The six carbons in the benzene are not equivalent. And the methyl, there will be seven carbons. And I actually have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Every peak corresponds to one carbon. But notice the, the heights of these uh, peaks. They are not uh, the same. So every peak corresponds to a set of equivalent carbons. It can be one, it can be 10. Okay? Now, one thing though, you should always uh, notice in a carbon-13 NMR spectrum, the Shorter peaks are always of quaternary carbons. Notice here that I have, uh, uh, first, which peak is this peak? CH3. CH3. The sp3 hybridized carbon is going to be the most uh, upfield. And then I have these four peaks that correspond to this CH, 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 CH. The two quaternary carbons, the carbon attached to OH and the carbon attached to the methyl groups are these two carbons. Which one is more downfield? The one that is attached to the oxygen is more downfield because oxygen is uh, more uh, electronegative. 
So you have seven carbons, you are getting seven signals, but the intensities are not uh, equal. I'm sorry? This one, the CDCL3 at 77 parts per million, the CDCL3, the triplet. Now, what about splitting? We are always observing carbon-13. We are running the experiment to observe all peaks in a carbon-13 as singlets. We don't, we, we run the experiment under conditions that are uh, called broadband decoupling to suppress multiplicity. Now, there are two types of multiplicities that you can observe. First, a C13, C13, because the carbon-13 has a spin of plus or minus half. So the same way do you can get the hydrogens to couple each other, you can have the carbons to couple each other. However, we already established, or we already learned, that the natural abundance of a carbon-13 is 1%. So the probability of finding two carbon-13 nuclei attached to each other is 10 minus 2 times 10 minus 2, which is 10 minus uh, 4. So you will never have two carbon-13 nuclei attached to each other. So you will never have uh, a carbon-13 coupling another carbon-13. But you can, of course, get the carbon to be coupled with the hydrogens. But if you allow this, you... Uh, might uh, make your life uh, uh, not as easy. This has to do with the fact because the carbon can be coupled to the hydrogens that are directly attached and also to the hydrogens that are vicinal. So you are going to get uh, a multiplet for every carbon and then you are not going to learn much in most of the cases. So you run the experiment under conditions that are called broadband decoupling, under these conditions, uh, you will suppress the splitting between the carbon-13 and the proton. Meaning, you will only get uh, singlets, and these singlets correspond to different carbon nuclei. Now, so how can you run an experiment to find out whether a carbon is a quaternary or a CH or CH2 or CH3. You can collect what's called a depth spectrum. Depth stands for distortionless enhancement of polarization transfer. Before I, I go into uh, how we, uh, we can run a depth spectrum, well, when you are collecting a carbon-13 and a spectrum, you are... Uh, doing four steps. The first step, while well, you are having an equilibration, equilibration of the nuclei between the lower and the higher spin states under the influence of magnetic field, and then you excite the nuclei from the lower to the higher spin state, and then you are having uh, the free induction decay, and then there will be the Fourier transform. So you are having uh, excitation, free induction decay, and then you are having the mathematical relation uh, so that you will uh, get the spectrum on the screen. In a carbon-13, you have to re repeat steps two and three over and over so that that signal can increase uh, in height. Okay, that's why we have to use uh, more concentrated samples. That's, how, that's why we need to run the experiment for longer uh, time. In that, what you do, you irradiate with another, uh, uh, with another uh, uh, FD. So you will have a second transmitter to irradiate the proton. The result of this, you will get some C C13 signals to remain as they are, others they will be inverted, and some C13 signals will disappear. Let me show you one example. This is the carbon-13. NMR spectrum of this ketone. How many different signals do I have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I have actually one, two, three, four, five, six, these are two peaks, seven, eight, nine. Notice the carbonyl of a ketone at around 200 parts per million. 
Now, how can we find out which peaks are CH2s, which peaks are CH3s, which are quaternary, which are CH? I run a depth. With the depth, the quaternary carbons, they will disappear. The quaternary carbons that I had in the previous spectrum, this quaternary carbon and this quaternary carbon, they are not here anymore. This is uh, the, the quaternary carbon for the benzene disappeared and that of the carbonate. The CH and CH3s, they remain above. While three peaks were inverted. So when you run a depth, you can right away identify the quaternary carbons and you can also identify all CH2 groups. The peaks that remain the same are combination of CH3s and CH peaks. Now I'm going to go into 2D and MR. I'm going to go over this uh, very briefly. There are two types of uh, 2D and MR. In 1D and MR, it means I have one axis. 2D and MR, it means I have two axes. The two uh, 2D and MR that we will talk about are the COSI, which stands for correlated spectroscopy, and HATCOR, the heteronuclear chemical shift correlation. The important thing about uh, these uh, two spectroscopic methods, they can tell us about connectivity in the terms of COSI. What are the protons that are coupling each other? In terms of hat core, it can tell you which carbon-13 corresponds to which protons. And I'm going to go over two examples. I have uh, a slide. The 2D NMR, and I have tried to redraw it on the board. I'm sure Talia can do a much better job in uh, drawing. But let's go over this. First two things here you need to identify. Diagonal peaks and cross peaks. Diagonal peaks, they exist on the diagonal. And cross peaks are not on the diagonal. Now what do I have in the spectrum? I have the proton. This is zero part per million. So this is from uh, zero and downfield. And this is from zero and downfield. It is the same NMR spectrum. This triplet is the same as this triplet. This sextet is the same as that. This pentet is right here. And this singlet is right here, and this triplet is right here. For every peak, I have a diagonal. This is the diagonal peak. This is a diagonal peak for these two. This is the diagonal peak for these two. And this is a diagonal peak for these two singlets. And this is a diagonal peak uh, of uh, that uh, triplet. Now, any time you see cross peaks between two diagonal peaks, the cross peaks are telling you that these two peaks are coupling each other. So when I am looking at this diagonal peak and this diagonal peak, I am able to draw a square right here. This tells me that these protons are coupled to these protons. I have diagonal peaks right here, and I have cross peaks right here. This tells me that these hydrogens are coupled to these hydrogens. The same right here. This tells me that uh, these hydrogens, how do I know these hydrogens? Because that is a diagonal. That diagonal peak, and that diagonal peak, they have cross peaks. This tells me that uh, these hydrogens are coupled to these hydrogens. OK, well, now notice here, for this diagonal peak, which is that of the singlet, I do not have uh, any cross peaks. That means these hydrogens are not coupled to any hydrogens. And this is, in fact, uh, 
through. What I have right here, this is uh, most downfield. Why is it the most downfield? It is closer to the carbonyl. And since it is a triplet, it must be the CH2, not the CH3. Because the CH3 must be a singlet. I have uh, the 1.6. This one is coupled to these two. How do I know it is coupled to these two? The diagonal peak is for, for instance, this diagonal peak is for this triplet and this triplet. You draw a horizontal and a vertical. That will get you the diagonal. Horizontal, uh, vertical, horizontal, that is diagonal. For every one, for every proton, you are going to get uh, a diagonal peak. Anytime you observe between two diagonal uh, peaks, cross peaks, that means these two nuclei are coupling each other. How am, I see, am I, how am I seeing it right here? Between these two diagonal peaks, I have these two cross peaks. So these hydrogens and these hydrogens must be coupling each other. The same between these two. I have cross peaks. So they are coupling each other. These two, they are coupling each other. Now, this, is, this example is a very straightforward example. Sometimes it's very hard to find which hydrogens are coupling each other. And you need to do 2D NMR. And you can use the 2D NMR to uh, come up with a structure based on connectivity of uh, proton nuclei. Now, this is as far as we will uh, cover in uh, uh, chemistry 212. Regarding head core, Head core, it tells you which hydrogens and which carbon-13 are uh, corresponding to each other. In a head core, you never observe a diagonal peak. You only have cross peaks. For instance, what you are having first in a head core, you are having one axis to be the carbon-13, the other axis to be the proton anomar. What you are observing here only cross peaks. And in these cross peaks, you are getting one, two, three, four, five. You have one, two, three, four, five. The carbonyl is at 210, and what we are having in the carbon-13, we are only taking part of the window. We are taking from zero to 50 part per million. Now, how can you find out whether this carbon is more downfield than this carbon in carbon-13? Both of them are attached to carbonyl. How can you find out which one of them is more downfield with a huge difference? You are going from 30 to 44 part per million. Now, you can argue. Yeah, you can argue that you are having this carbon to be attached to a carbonyl and CH2, while this carbon is at, while this carbon is only attached to a carbonyl. That can actually work in this particular example, but in many others, it, it cannot. Now look at the beauty of a hat core. You take a vertical line and a horizontal line that tells you this carbon 13 is that of these hydrogens. These hydrogens are triplet. The most, uh, wh which hydrogens are triplet here? They must be this CH2. These protons are correlated with this carbon. That means that the carbon that is most downfield is the, that of the methylene group. This singlet, we know it is that of uh, CH3. And now we know which, which carbon is that of the CH3. It is the 30 part per million. We know which uh, hydrogens are uh, the pentat, these pentat hydrogens. This is the carbon of the pentat hydrogen. And here you have the sextet, and that will be for uh, this carbon. And here you are having uh, the triplet, and that triplet uh, will be that of the, methylene, uh, of the methyl uh, group. So let me uh, summarize this section. 
in terms of uh, 2D and MR, we, talk about, we talked about COSI and a hat core. In a COSI, you are having a proton-proton correlation. You have two axes. On both axes, you are having the proton and MR spectrum. You are having cross peaks, and you are having diagonal peaks. The diagonal peaks, every diagonal peak corresponds to a set of hydrogens. Wherever you see uh, cross peaks, it tells you that these two diagonal peaks are coupled to each other. Now, with the hat core, you are having the proton on one axis and the carbon-13 on the other. You draw a vertical line and a horizontal line. That tells you which protons are corresponding to which carbon. This will conclude the NMR. And now we will start with the second spectroscopic technique, and that is uh, the IR. Infrared spectroscopy, it is abbreviated as IR. IR, it gives you information about the functional groups in a molecule. As I introduced at the beginning of this, of, uh, this chapter, that IR can tell you whether certain functional groups are present in the compound, or if these groups are absent. It can tell you whether you are having a primary alcohol or a secondary alcohol or a tertiary. You cannot, uh, by just looking at the IR spectrum, find out whether you are having a pentanol or a hexanol or a heptanol. But you can definitely conclude that your alcohol, uh, uh, that you are having an alcohol in the compound. The region of infrared that is uh, most useful to us uh, lies between 625 wave number and 4,000 wave number, or 2.5 and 16 micrometer. Whenever you are talking about IR, you're talking about uh, transitions between vibrational energy states. And these transitions are either stretching or uh, bending. Let's look. Uh, we will look at some examples of stretching and bending, but I would like to divide the IR into two regions. The functional group region, and that is between 1600 and 4000 wave number, and the fingerprint region between 625 and 1300 wave number. Fingerprint region cannot be the same for two different uh, compounds. Stretching vibration of a methylene group. You can have a symmetric stretching, so you are uh, stretching the two CHs in the same direction, or you can have uh, anti-symmetric. An anti-symmetric, you are actually stretching them in opposite directions. Bending vibrations of a methylene group, you have four different uh, bending vibrations. You can have the scissoring, you can have the rocking, you can have the wagging, and you can have uh, the twisting. The Bending vibrations of a methylene group, they are going to lead into different peaks in the IR spectrum. Now, why do you observe a peak in an, in an IR spectrum? This has to do with the fact that any time you are stretching or bending, you are changing the dipole moment of the bond. And the greater the change in the dipole moment, the more intense the peak is. This is why when you are having a bond between two atoms that are of uh, totally different electronegativities, you are going to see a very intense peak in the IR spectrum. So you cannot miss a carbonyl peak in an IR spectrum because of uh, the large change in the magnitude of the dipole moment in the carbonyl. So the more uh, the difference in electronegativity is between the two atoms, uh, the larger the change in the molecular dipole moment, and therefore the stronger the intensity in the IR uh, spectrum. The intensities are usually expressed in percent uh, transmittance. This is uh, a, uh, um, just an overview of IR uh, stretches and uh, bending of different functional groups. In the fingerprint region, 
you can see the CC, CN, and CO single bond stretching as well as bending, as well as the CH bending. Between 1620 and 1850, you can see the double bond stretching for the CO, CN, and CC. For the CC and CN triple bond, it's very characteristic. You cannot miss a C triple bond C or a C triple bond N in an IR uh, spectrum because only C triple bond C and C triple bond N, they appear in this region. 2100 to 2300 wave number. And between 2850 and 3600, the OH, NH, and CH single bond uh, stretching, they appear in this uh, region. How does the mass influence the vibration? Well, the greater the mass, uh, the lower the wave number. The molecular weight of iodine is 254 54 gram per mole, while that of a hydrogen molecule is 2 gram per mole. And as I said, functional groups that have a strong dipole, they will give uh, to strong absorption in the IR. Of course, we have a strong dipole anytime we are having a bond between two atoms of different uh, electronegativities. I'm going to go over uh, a set of spectra. And I want to draw your attention, how do we identify some peaks in uh, IR? For instance, this is a typical IR uh, spectrum of an alkane. Now, uh, what can you see in this IR spectrum? All you can see are these uh, intense stretches below 3,000 wave number. These correspond to a stretch between an sp3 hybridized carbon and the hydrogen now the bending ch and cc bending they are at 1460 and 1380 wave number but they are not going to tell us much in this ir spectrum if i am looking at it all i can see is that i have sp3 hybridized carbon because i have these intense peaks uh, below 3000 because above 3,000, you will get the sp2 carbon H stretch. So the stretch between an sp2 hybridized carbon and the hydrogen, that appears above 3,000. So if you draw a vertical line right here, you are going to see below 3,000. That tells you you are, having an alkene, uh, you are having an sp3 hybridized carbon or sp3 hybridized carbons. And... Uh, Above, that tells you you have uh, a, an sp2 hybridized carbon bonded to a hydrogen. That's how you are getting the CH uh, stretch. You have uh, here a weak uh, stretch at 1642 for the C double bond C. And you have the CH and CC bending. These, they are not going to tell us uh, much. Let me go over uh, some uh, numbers. The CH for an sp Hybridized carbon, if you are having a terminal alkyne, you cannot miss an sp hybridized carbon bonded to a hydrogen. Because you are having a very strong, intense stretch at 3300 wave number. That is uh, for SPCH. If you have SP2CH above 3000, SP3CH below 3000, right below 3000. A CO for an sp2 hybridized carbon at 1200, for an sp3 hybridized carbon at 1025 to 1200. These are the stretching vibrations. C double bond C at 1620 to 1680. C triple bond C, if you are having an unsymmetrical alkyne, you will see a C triple bond C at 2100 to 2200 wave number. So if you are having a terminal alkyne, it can be easily detected in an IR because you will have a strong stretch. Well, according to you, the strong stretch for the sp hybridized carbon to a hydrogen from the way where you are standing at 3300. And you are having for C triple bond C a medium to weak stretch at 2100 to 2200. C triple bond N can never be missed in an IR spectrum because it is the only stretch that appears at 2200 wave number. Aldehydes and ketones, 
You have a, a, a strong stretch for the carbonyl at 1710 to 1750, carboxylic acid 1700 to 1725, anhydrides, you will have two stretches. At 1800 to 1850 and 1740 to 1790, for esters at 1730 to 1750, and the amides at 1680 to 1700. The last uh, slide I will go over uh, today. Bending vibrations for alkenes. For a terminal alkene, you will get two peaks at 910 and 990. Uh, for a monosubstituted, for a disubstituted, you will get at 890 cis uh, disubstituted alkene 665 to 730. These are the bending vibrations. For the trans, you will have it at 960 to 980. For trisubstituted, you will get it at 790 to 840. I'm going to stop right here.